Part one. You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be, and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly, we normally send out a copy of our leaflet, staying healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of six pounds fifty. Okay. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory. And if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment, I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street. But I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the north campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever. Really, they can even arrange financial help.、Hmm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. I'll say it again: o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the south campus in the sports centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of twenty-two pounds to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets, or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O. N Y.、Uh, no, I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then, or is O R R. Or, okay. 
And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students talking about a school project. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Lynn. How's your project coming along? Oh, not very well. I've got all the information, but I can't seem to organise it into a presentation. Well, you'd better hurry. You only have one more week. Yes, that's OK. It's just that... Oh. Well, why don't you try your presentation on me? Maybe I can help. Oh, really? Great! OK, well, I've chosen solar power for my subject and I'm going to talk specifically about domestic water heating. You know, like the ones popular in America. I've got some facts here. Well, that's good. But just start your presentation from the beginning. Oh, right. Well, he here we go then. There are many reasons why we should be looking elsewhere for energy sources. As most people are aware, fossil fuels and other such non-renewable sources are by definition finite, so something needs to be in operation soon. Currently, there are a number of alternative energy sources available which can, with a little preparation, be used to provide for a significant part of our domestic energy requirements. In this presentation, I am focusing on solar power and its application as a domestic water heater. As a renewable energy source, solar power is in many ways ideal. The amount of the sun's energy which reaches the earth every minute exceeds the energy that the global population consumes in a year. Although scientists argue that it is not finite, sunlight is certainly a long-lasting resource which is not depleted through use, and solar power converters use this energy without needing any complex moving parts. Once collected and stored, solar energy can be used for many purposes, but it is becoming increasingly popular as a domestic heating source. Generally, a building that is heated by solar power will have its water heated by solar power as well, and this has even worked in areas that are not exposed to long hours of direct sunlight, such as the United Kingdom, although not so well as in warmer climates. Why have you stopped? Well, that's all I've got so far. Oh, well. 
Start by talking about how effective it is. Oh, okay. Well, there are a number of factors that influence how efficient solar power can be. The first, obviously, is the amount of sunlight, and this is dependent on season, time of day and climate. Although the UK has something of a bad reputation for sunshine, it is actually quite productive during some parts of the year. Given a sufficient size of solar panel and water storage tank, solar power can provide all of our water heating requirements in June and July and even provide the majority until October. From October to the end of the year, this figure falls dramatically. December is the least productive, being able to supply less than 5% of the average household's hot water requirement. It is at this point that solar power needs to be supplemented with a more traditional form of heating. From January, solar power becomes more effective at a rate of about 20% per month, although this rise decelerates to around 18% by May. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now say something about this water heater. Do you have any information about that? Oh yes, I've got an illustration of a water tank here. Well, that's good, but you'll have to describe it. Right. Well, the ideal water tank in the UK has a capacity of 45 to 50 litres, but must be at least 40 litres to be effective. The solar coil is put in the bottom of the tank to heat the water. Now remember that solar heated water will not get quite as hot as fossil fuel water heaters. The bottom half of the tank is normally 20 degrees, and this is why it is important not to have a tank that is too large, as that would take too much energy to heat. In this illustration, it rises to 40 degrees from halfway up. Don't forget that hot water rises, so the top third of the tank is the hottest and reaches an average temperature of 65 degrees. And what's the second layer around the tank? Oh, that's insulation. Because the tank is often either outside or just under the roof, rigid foam is used as an insulation layer. It should be at least 80 millimetres thick all around. Well, that seems like a good presentation. All you need to do is to prepare some short notes and a larger illustration so you can use it as a demonstration and you'll be fine. Oh, you think so? Well, thanks very much for the help. Maybe I could do the same for you one day. Maybe. Anyway, I have to go. Good luck. Thanks. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. Before you listen to their conversation, you have a chance to read questions 21 to 24. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. 
physically that is my uh, my very thorough re-examination and the the analyst report show that basically you are very fit yes very fit so why is it doctor that i'm always so nervy tense ready to jump on anybody my wife children colleagues i think um i think your condition has a lot to do with um shall we call it way of life habits way of life habits yes now tell me mr jackson you smoke don't you yes i'm afraid i'm afraid i do doctor and uh, rather heavily i imagine well yes i smoke what about 40 50 a day i suppose you should do your best to stop you know yes i see but uh well it won't be the first time i've tried to give up smoking several times but it's it's no good you see 50 a day is overdoing it you must admit you must cut down at least that oh yes i know that when you're feeling tense you you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you but in the long run i do advise you to make to make a real effort to quit smoking of course but well it's easy to say give it up or cut it down but oh you know well in my opinion you have no choice either you make a real effort or or there's no real chance of your feeling better you see well obviously i could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer but would that help i'd prefer and i'm quite sure you'll agree i'd prefer to see you really back to normal not just seemingly so and that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits right now you have a chance to read questions 25 to 30 as you listen to more of their conversation answer questions 25 to 30 your eating habits for example what do you eat normally during a normal day yes well i'm a good eater yes i'd say i'm a good eater now let's see up at 8 in the morning and my wife has a good breakfast ready a good breakfast the usual a cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two then toast and marmalade all washed down with a couple of cups of tea i uh yes i really enjoy my breakfast uh yes i can see you do but i'd advise you to eat rather less we'll come to that later go on then lunch no first brunch a cup of coffee and a bun at 11 lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time so i have a pint and a sandwich in the pub all very hurried try to be in less of a hurry but i make up for it in the evening i get home at about 7 dinners around about 8 uh yes my wife's an excellent cook excellent it's usually some meat dish and we like spaghetti as a first course spaghetti a meat dish cheese sweet but uh but then at the end of the day shall we say then well then i begin to feel on edge again most evenings after dinner we read or watch tv but i i get this terrible feeling of tension well i'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food but um i really do recommend that you that you eat less and secondly that you eat more healthily instead of having that enormous breakfast for example um well try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal i see but uh elevenses right well that's all right but lunch should be more leisurely remember your health is at stake not your job as for dinner um i'd advise you to eat a soup perhaps with a salad 
A salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb, granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, Doctor. But no. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four, a second session on interview skills. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our second session on interview skills. Now we have already looked at what to say in the interview and what to wear, so let's consider non-verbal behaviour, or as it is more often called, body language. Believe it or not. Research has shown that this is what makes the strongest impression on people we meet. Frequent eye contact is one aspect of body language which goes down very well with interviewers, and creates a good impression. Looking at people means that you're sure of yourself and confident. In fact, one famous car company even makes a note of the level of eye contact candidates make during their recruitment process for this very reason. So it is very important to maintain eye contact. But be careful how you do it. Avoid staring, as this is a sign of hostility. But avoiding eye contact altogether and looking away or down is even worse. But the general message is maintain that eye contact. Believe me, the eyes have it. Now, along with eye contact, smiling is one of the other important non-verbal actions which say more to the interviewer than any answers you give. A good way to create a good impression during the first few minutes of your interview is to smile warmly when you meet the person or people who will be interviewing you. It shows them that you are relaxed. Facial scanning takes a triangular route, from the eyes down to the mouth and back to the eyes. Even when you aren't speaking, an interviewer will be noticing your mouth, so give a relaxed smile whenever you feel it is appropriate. Now, not surprisingly, interviewers pay most attention to a person's face or head during an interview, and they certainly pick up a lot on what they see. Researchers have identified nodding as going down very well with interviewers. This simple gesture shows that you are listening and paying attention. Another useful head gesture is to tilt your head slightly to one side. Now, this reinforces that you are listening well to what the interviewer is saying to you. However, tilting your head back isn't such a good idea, as this signals arrogance, and drooping your head forward indicates that you are lacking in confidence. And as we all know, that is exactly the opposite of what an interviewer wants to see. So the message is: mind your head. Now, posture, or the way that you carry yourself, is an important area of body language to be aware of, and it is one of the first body language signals that interviewers read as you enter a room. 
Posture also matters when you're sitting down. A well-supported position, with your shoulders square and sitting full back on the chair, will give the impression that you are confident, which is just what the interviewer wants to see. I once interviewed a candidate who perched right on the edge of her chair throughout. I kept feeling that she was about to run out of the room in terror. However, occasionally leaning forward slightly when the interviewer is speaking reinforces the message that you are keen and interested, as well as showing the interviewer that you're actually listening to what they are saying. But don't overdo it by leaning too far forward. That can be a bit distracting for the interviewer. Now, we all tend to use our hands to gesture, especially when we are explaining something or as we become involved in what we are saying. This is fine. It shows that we are keen and perhaps even excited about something. However, what can work against someone at an interview is when they fidget. This kind of moving about is, of course, what we do when we are nervous and fidgeting can be very distracting to watch. So if this is a problem for you when you get nervous, it is a good idea to practice sitting with your hands gently resting in your lap or on the arms of the chair. Try not to fold your arms, though, as this tends to look uncomfortable or hostile. But whatever movements you make, be careful with your hands. They need to be kept well away from your mouth, head or face. In fact, experts say that when a hand flies up to or over a person's mouth, it implies that the person is worried or wound up about something. For most of us, staying calm in an interview situation is a challenge, so putting in a bit of practice in advance will help. So, to end with, here are a couple of suggestions on how to improve our body language. A good idea is to choose a role model, such as an actor or fictional character, or a public figure or someone you know. Then sit calmly and imagine that you are this person. Now, other countries have different body language signals. So remember that if you are being interviewed abroad, you may want to check if there are any special gestures to avoid. It's also a good idea to get used to reading body language signals. You can do this by simply watching how people interact in public places, such as on the streets or in restaurants. And finally, when people have struck up a rapport, it is reflected through the natural mirroring of each other's body language movements. So you can use this to your advantage by occasionally mirroring the interviewer's own movements. For example, if they lean over to one side, you can do the same a few seconds later. It helps to create a special effect known as similar to me. But don't do it too often or the interviewer will notice. Now, any questions before we move on to interview listening skills? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I thought I had it figured out Believed in us We were meant to be, no doubt A teenage love Everybody else could see The way we were Living in a fantasy When I kiss her 